Hold on one second. You may proceed. Okay. Calling the uh, to order this special work session of Independent School District 624. Um, would the clerk read the roll, please? Beloyed. Beloyed. Here. I think she said she couldn't hear. Chapman. Here. here. Ellison, here. Mullen. Absent. Newmaster. Here. Thompson. Here. Arcane. Here. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, with that, we will proceed to the uh, one and only discussion item, uh, the fall 2020 reopening plan overview. Uh, Dr. Kazmierczak. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chapman, members of the board. I wanna just confirm, uh, uh, Deb, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear now. Okay, all right. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. We are here to, uh, to talk about the return to school plan for the coming year. And uh, so go ahead, Steve, advance. The presentation today is similar to last week. There's, there's it's certainly been changed, but we're um, gonna move through a couple things a little bit more quickly. So the, today the focus is gonna be on the hybrid learning model as well as, uh, and, go ahead, Steve. Uh, the, uh, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the in, um, on the in-person learning model, but we're going to talk mostly about the hybrid and then uh, distance, which which is certainly part of that. Um, we we touched on our committee structure uh, last week. We have we've had uh, dozens of people working on on this uh, throughout the summer. Go ahead, Steve. Advance. We shared some uh, survey data last week from June. Um, Again, I, th I think um, one thing I'll, I'll note is that the, when asked about preferred learning model, in-person learning was preferred by 60 per 65, about 65% of respondents. When asked about preferred learning model when in-person was not available, hybrid model was preferred by 76.5% of respondents. And I, I want to just show, go ahead, Steve. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in one more slide, I'll show, uh, or a couple more, I'll show, um, yeah, go ahead. We've, we've talked about the thought, the thought exchange. The thought exchange was a great way to get feedback and we, a lot of topics raised to the top. It showed, uh, it showed a very, very much, a um, divided opinion about, uh, whatever seemed to be asked. One emergent theme, however, was, uh, was certainly safety amongst other things. So go ahead, Steve. And I just wanted to compare this. So this is what we just, uh, sent out. Uh, this week, would you choose the distance learning model, meaning your child would be learning from home all day, every day, regardless of whether we are able to offer any in-person during the school year? And at this point, we've got uh, about a 20% um, indicating uh, that they would choose distance learning. So, and then, and then the undecided mark. So the, the data are relatively consistent from June to now. Um, and I think you know we've heard from some that uh, they're waiting to learn more about the hybrid model before making a decision. So, okay, go ahead, Steve. All right. So we have guidance from uh, from the Department of uh, Health and Depart Department of Education, and we've talked about this. So let's just go ahead to the go ahead, Steve. We're going to move through some of this relatively quickly. So these are the learning model parameters, and go ahead one more. So these are the figures that were released yesterday. So Ramsey County has the highest figure at 19.65. And so that puts us in that, in that borderline of that in-person learning for elementary students with hybrid learning for secondary students. Um, and then the next category would be the hybrid learning for all students. And I'll talk a little bit about data and some other data that, that we've used to, um, that we've looked at uh, a little bit later today. But that's where we are right now. So we're still in that uh, in that range. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> All right. So our tonight we're, or today we're going to talk about um, the recommendation being that we return to school in a hybrid learning model for grade, for grades K through 12 plus. So students would attend school in person and be home 
learning on an A-B day rotation by alphabet Monday through Thursday. And then student, all students would be home learning on Fridays. And then the distance learning model is available to all families who wish to choose that as an option. Okay, go ahead, Steve. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Walder, Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations. And he is gonna lead us through the health and safety portion of the presentation. All right, thank you, Dr. Kaferchuk. So the uh, balancing act between our public safety needs and our need to educate our children is really the, the balancing act that we're trying to uh, work with here. And it's, it's very challenging, of course. Um, it's an evolving situation and we continue to follow the science. And so as we uh, make decisions about how we're gonna create a safe environment to learn and to work in, uh, we're paying attention to the science and that's what will guide us. Um, but to maintain a safe environment for learning and teaching, uh, sanitation is an important part of it. So our cleaning protocols are have been reviewed and we'll be using enhanced disinfecting during the day. Uh, we've been uh, collecting CDC approved sanitation products to make sure we have plenty on hand. And we'll be using those throughout the day to disinfect our high touch areas, those um, you know doorknobs and handrails, et cetera, that get touched frequently. And then during the evenings, we'll be doing a deep sanitation where all surface areas in our classrooms and our restrooms will be sprayed with electrostatic sprayers. And that, that material just really clings to all surfaces and creates a, a excellent sanitation. Our classrooms will be equipped with spray bottles with CDC approved um, safe disinfectant, paper towels, we'll have hand sanitizers in all our rooms that don't have sinks soap and paper towels in rooms with sinks. And then each classroom will be equipped with CDC approved uh, disinfecting wipes. Um, in our common spaces, hand sanitizers will be strategically placed. And so where you enter, where there's a, a entrance to the building, that's a common entrance. We'll have hand sanitizers there as we approach cafeterias where students are served, there'll be an opportunity to use hand sanitizer there and other locations throughout the building. Um, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, quite a few rubber gloves on, on hand, certainly enough for all of our classrooms. Um, those are already secured. Face shields, we have a thousand in stock already and uh, uh, MDE is gonna provide us with another thousand. We'll have two washable face masks per student and staff member, along with 50,000 disposable masks that are already uh, in stock. Uh, plexiglass barriers have been secured and are in our health office and high traffic offices. Our custodians will have N95 masks and eye goggles for when they use the electrostatic sprayers. And they've been through a training already with that and there's a medical ap approval that needs to go with uh, using an N95 mask in a school. And so that process is already well in place. Um, and then we'll have additional PPE for health offices and some special ed areas, protective gowns being an example of something that'd be appropriate for a health office and in some of our special ed areas. Um, we've, we are securing a significant amount of signage to be placed around our buildings. You won't be able to walk into our buildings without being quite aware um, that you have a personal responsibility to follow um, safety rules. So I mentioned here floor graphics that include directional arrows and distance markers, wall signage, hand washing reminders, self-screening reminders when uh, students and staff enter our buildings. Uh, ventilation and water systems are an important uh, consideration for the health of our buildings and, and all of us who will spend time in those facilities. Our maintenance teams will flush all of our water systems prior to our students and staff returning. That's important when a building has sat dormant for, for, you know, for a number of months. And, and uh, there's probably never been a time where buildings have sat dormant as long as, uh, as they have at this point. And so all that is being flushed. Our drinking fountains will be disabled, but we will have water bottle fillers um, active in all of our buildings. And in fact, we have at least one water bottle filler in each floor of all of our sites. Um, in, in many, in most cases, probably more than that. So thanks to Dan Rozier and his maintenance team for getting more of those installed this summer. Uh, ventilation in our buildings, our maintenance teams will work to make sure those are operating 
efficiently and properly. Our ex exhaust fans in our buildings will run 24-7. Our uh, in our older buildings, especially our secondary buildings, um, North Campus, our, both our middle schools, the ALC, uh, have older ventilation systems. And so we're working with Halberg Engineering to review each classroom to make sure that the ventilation is operating efficiently uh, and effectively. So that is occurring throughout the month of August and we will have each classroom reviewed to make sure it's working. Um, our newer ventilation systems have electronic computerized controls, and so we'll, we'll be working with Halberg engineers to make th sure those settings are optimized. We have replaced all of our air filters throughout the district, and we're doubling the frequency with which we change our air filters during this period. And in our restrooms, we don't blow air in our restrooms, we, we exhaust the air in our restrooms, and so our, we'll maximize that exhaust systems in each of our restrooms. Okay. Uh, is Lisa Oren with us? Uh, she was not sure she'd be able to be part of this. Appears that she's not, so I'll, I'll cover this. Um, the Center for Disease Control does not recommend universal screening be conducted by schools. And so this is something schools have spent some time on. How are we gonna screen our students? And the CDC suggests that schools not do that. And so we'll follow, again, as I mentioned earlier, we'll follow the science on these things. And, so, and the science is saying, don't do universal screening in schools. And so what we, what we will do though, is we'll educate our staff, students and families about the symptoms, recognizing the symptoms and informing them that they should stay home when, when, when they're not well and they should, re and, and letting them know when it's appropriate to return to school. We ask families to monitor their children before they send them to school. Uh, we'll ask our students and staff to monitor themselves throughout the day. Um, our, our, nursing, our nurses have prepared monitoring kits um, that will be available in each of our buildings, multiple monitoring kits. I think there's one per grade level actually in our, in our elementary schools. And if there are symptomatic individuals, we'll be able to do immediate monitoring. Um, and then we have, we have uh, designated spaces, should anyone appear to be symptomatic, that we'll move them into a designated space. And those spaces have already been defined in each of our buildings. Okay. Uh, moving on to transportation. Uh, another significant challenge and um, hats off to Mike Torito and his team in the transportation office who have been working with moving targets on what transportation might look like for the fall. Usually at this point, they're just wrapping up uh, their bus routes for the school year. And so they've, um, uh, they've been prepared to pivot very quickly. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, maximum capacity of 50% on buses. Again, we're following the science and the guidelines on transportation. Um, to do that, we, we need to reduce the ridership on our buses. And so we're asking parents to partner with us and transport their students to school as much as, the, as that is possible to keep kids off, as many kids off the bus as possible. We're increasing the qualifying distance for busing to one mile for grades K to five and 1.5 miles from grades six through 12. Um, we're asking families to be, to actively sign up for transportation. So there'll be, um, uh, a Google form going out to families, I think beginning today, that will provide them an opportunity to opt in for transportation. And so we'll be setting up routes for those families who opt in. Um, we're only gonna be able to do one pickup stop uh, per student. And so students who use different stops during the week, we're gonna ask those families to consolidate that to one stop during the week. We're asking parents to screen their children for symptoms prior to boarding. And again, that transfer, uh, transportation opt-in form is due August 16th. And I, I guess I didn't list it on here, but all students will be wearing, I guess that's coming up, all students and staff will be wearing masks on the buses. Okay, uh, yeah, it's coming up. Okay, so uh, we're, treating our, we're treating our buses and our vans very much like a classroom. So we'll have enhanced disinfecting throughout the day on our transportation vehicles. After each route, our drivers will be uh, 
will be sanitizing uh, touch areas, handrails, seat backs, those types of things. And then at, during the evenings, again, we'll be using electrostatic sprayers in our transportation vehicles. Um, like our classrooms, our, our vehicles will be equipped with cleaning supplies, spray bottles with uh, disinfectant, hand, hand sanitizer, um, wipes and gloves. Ventilation in our vehicles, uh, no less important there than anywhere else. Roof vents will remain open and, and uh, windows partially open when that's appropriate and safe. Okay, we're gonna continue to feed the students. And so nutrition services, um, uh, again, has been preparing for lots of dis different scenarios. They, I can't tell you how many different menus they've worked up over the last month, um, but that's coming together. Our, again, uh, capacity for in our cafeterias is, will be limited, of course, and so we, we want to keep food out of classrooms where we can, and so we'll eat in cafeterias where it's possible, adhering, to, of course, to social distancing guidelines. Uh, principals are identifying other areas and buildings that could be used for uh, eating areas, and we'll eat in classrooms as needed. We're hoping to reduce that to the degree possible, um, but it's likely that in some cases we'll need to eat in classrooms. We'll stagger, stagger meal time so that um, we don't have lot, we don't have kids standing in lines uh, for a long period of time to get their meals. So we'll stagger those times. We can social distance in the lines. The meals will be pre-plated. There will be no self-serving opportunities. Um, We'll have meals to take home on days, on distance learning days. Um, and there'll be a one time a week that there'll be a meal pickup for ch for families choosing distance learning and an opportunity to pre-order uh, for those students who are participating in the hybrid plan uh, for the days they don't have school, they can pre-order and they'll be able to pick those up on the days they are in school. At this point, we're working with the funding that's available and it doesn't appear that there's gonna be any enhanced funding in nutrition services. So um, meal prices are listed and those are the same prices we have right now. And of course, uh, free and reduced students will qualify for lunches. We won't have students using pin pads to start the school year just to uh, reduce a touch point. And again, we'll have PPE available for our kitchen staff. Um, face masks and shields, gloves, aprons as usual, and disinfecting using food grade disinfectant and they'll continue to clean and sanitize and clean and sanitize touch areas between serving. Okay, okay uh, so this is a different topic. Uh, in the case that we have a suspected or identified COVID-19 case, uh, how will schools respond? And Matt Mons is gonna take this one. Yes, and we're going to <clears throat> respond in the same way that we've been responding through the spring and summer, which is working extremely closely and collaboratively with the Minnesota Department of Health in order to ensure that we identify all close and general contacts, so both those at a high or risk or low risk, um, so that we're able to inform them in a timely fashion. So that's how we've been handling it. It's been a system that's worked extremely well. We've been very impressed with the responsiveness of the Minnesota De uh, Department of Health. And we would expect that that collaboration would continue. Um, if anything, I think all parties have gotten better at working through those processes. So that's largely in the case of an, of an identified um, case of COVID. In the case that we have uh, that somebody has symptoms or that it's suspected, then we also have protocols in place for that. Um, Tim had mentioned the designated areas that we have in each of our sites, and we will have uh, trained, we already have, and will and will have a more robust team of trained staff that can work through those situations. Um, we will have a COVID response team at each of our sites. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a collaboration between school and, and our families, and so we're going to need to work together. And these are ideas that are consistent with what our social workers and 
uh, student services staff have been discussing that we ask parents, talk to your children about returning to school in September, help build a level of comfort for our students um, for when they return. Uh, model at home, wearing that face mask, washing hands, uh, recognizing you know, the, the amount, right amount of time to wash hands and to do a good job. Being aware of social distancing. If our students practice this at home, we think they're gonna be better at it when they get to school. Um, picking out a face covering with your child, make sure if, if you can that it's something they're, they're happy to be in, something that's comfortable to them and they understand um, putting on the face mask, taking it off, not touching the face mask except for in the ears uh, when you put it on and off. Um, encourage your child to ask questions, communicate their feelings. It's important to kids that they're their parents, those people that they care and love and trust the most are giving them um, uh, messages of confidence moving into this restarting school. And there's a lot of ways that kids, you know, kids like to be together, they like to touch, they like to hug. Um, all of that's uh, great, except it's not gonna work in schools. And so uh, there are lots of ways to show you care about your friends, virtual hugs, you can dance, just keep your distance. Uh, raise the roof, have some fun, uh, keep your distance, elbow bumps, all those types of things that, that we as adults are learning and I'm sure our kids are learning over the past few months, ways to express our appreciation for each other. And, and so any of those, working with your kids on those would be great. Okay, this is moving on to uh, Allison. Yep, thank you. So as we um, continue to look at the our hybrid and distance learning model, this uh, is an extremely complex task that has um, been very collaborative throughout the summer and um, having three distinct committees really looking at two different things. One, the how in terms of what would the scheduling look like and, and some of those logistics in our buildings. And then the other one is, is the what in terms of how are we going to navigate learning for our students. And so, Steve, you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned this last time, but really it was important to me and important to our organization that we build upon what we started in the spring. And in the spring, that was very much crisis learning and we, we learned a lot of important lessons, um, some things we wanna continue doing, but lots that we wanted to build upon and, and push forward and, and make um, an enhanced experience for our families. And so talking and, and using the learning from the spring, ensuring that we have high quality educational experiences for our students and that's knowing distance learning was going to be a component. And we've known that since the beginning, knowing that um, at the very least, before we knew that you know families were going to, going to have the choice, we made the decision that we would um, have allow families to make that choice, but we also have families who medically um, or their own personal beliefs wouldn't feel um, comfortable having students come to school. And so my whole premise this whole time has been that distance learning can't be seen as a less than model. And we also can't expect our teachers to have multiple planning of, of different, um, you know, a, a distance learning lesson, a hybrid lesson, what does that look like? And so we've had three different committees working, an elementary school committee, a middle school committee, and a high school committee. They've done amazing work and they're still working. And so I have some of their almost finished products to share today as we look at what does that look like and, and how can we meet those mandates. But all of this is centered in our strategic plan and ensuring that we're taking a a, a leap towards what we hope to be beyond this. And so the work that our staff will engage in um, isn't for simply right now as we try to get through this really difficult time. It is pushing our organization and our learning um, forward. And so how do we structure and really look at what learning is and what type of activities we wanna create for our students, but also how can we have the most supportive structure in terms of professional development time and collaboration time for our, our staff? Steve, you can go to the next slide. So attendance will follow um, the Minnesota Department of Education attendance reporting requirements. We always will be flexible with our families and understand um, that there'll be some barriers, but we really are working and pushing forward that students will engage in learning, uh, synchronous learning daily, and that's K-12. And so that'll look different at each level, but that they're having a face-to-face -face contact with their teachers and classmates. And um, we received a lot of feedback that, that um, students miss that, teachers miss that, and so how can we create the structure and expectation that we have that, knowing that we also will be flexible um, and support our families as, as barriers 
will inevitably pop up for, for our students and families. Grading, as I mentioned before, we are um, have begun conversations with grading. Letter grades will be utilized in each model, and we're really looking at how can we continue to build upon the equitable grade equitable grading practices that we started and we've started prior to distance learning. We aligned more in the spring and then um, incorporating letter grades and what that will look like. And we will bring that to the board work study session on August 24th. So when we look at ensuring equity and access for all of our families, we're really excited about getting better at helping families understand the ways that they can communicate with us if, if their first language or second language isn't English. And so we have, access for them to either know how to send us an email and let us know and or um, contact us and, and leave a voicemail to let us know that we need to call back with an interpreter. Our cultural liaisons are amazing at pushing our system forward in terms of how do we really look at creating access for our, for our students and families, but also connecting in a really authentic way with our students and families and, and making sure that there's back and forth communication and feedback. Um, we have obviously a really robust program of student support services, including Section 504 special education. And then our technology department did great work in the spring and a really um, difficult and crunch time to ensure that families had access to a device if they weren't a student in our system that had one-to-one -one Chromebooks and will continue to support access to internet hotspots for families who may have ba barriers with internet. We also have a parent tech helpline if there are questions um, throughout the year. So this, all of this is based in regardless of the learning model a family would choose that we're committed to providing engaging, equitable, and quality learning experience for each student. I know that at the core of who I am that that's one of our greatest um, desires as leaders, as teachers, um, to really meet that need in, in a time that is, I don't know, that I hope that we don't have a more difficult time than this. This is a very challenging time to navigate all the different feelings and emotions that come out just being in this pandemic and then how do we support our students in their learning uh, to ensure that they can, um, you know, move forward and, and learn really important skills that will support them well beyond this current time. So as we look at our K-12 Oh, sorry. <laughs> as we look at, you can go, Steve, sorry. Um, as we look at our hybrid model, we have a K-12 model that's aligned, and then we have our early childhood and bare fundamentals. And I know that staff is in, really excited to reach out to families and, and work with them so that we can continue to support the early childhood um, and families who enroll in bare fundamentals. And they'll have in-person classes for the students on the days and times for which the families registered. And then they'll be actively working to set up distance learning platforms if and when we would have to shift to distance learning as a district so that families and students would know how to access that and not have an interruption in their services while we were on that. Um, our school district uses Google and um, Seesaw at the younger ages, so they, they would um, look to use those platforms as well. So our hybrid model has changed, our proposed hybrid model excuse me, has changed since last Friday. Um, if you remember, we had um, a different model where elementary students were in school for three days a week, and then we were looking for secondary at two. We've refined that based on feedback from um, our staff and families and, and really looking at the benefits of having students in school three days and then um, some of the safety precautions that our educators requested and helped um, you know, ensure consistency for students and really feeling like if students were in um, an AB model or 50% in cohorts that that consistency and scheduling would benefit them and provide um, really a great level of support as we push forward and support them in their academic skills. So our proposal is all student K-12+, plus, including our Alternative Learning Center and our Transition Education Center, will be divided into two groups by household or alphabetical. And we're still working exactly on what that alphabetical split would be. Um, but each week, students in both groups will participate in a combination of in-person learning and dist distance learning and alternating between days. And this really allows teachers to have touch points in terms of face-to-face -face learning with students, students seeing each other being in school, um, and then having distance learning at home uh, so that we're able to meet those social distancing and the safety protocols that uh, Tim Wald talked about earlier. So a weekly schedule would look like Mondays and Wednesdays, student group A would attend in person and student group B would be at home for distance learning. Tuesdays and Thursdays, student group B would attend in person and student group A would be at home for distance learning. 
And then Friday would be an at-home independent learning day for all of our students. It'll allow our educators to connect with small groups um, digitally, individually, remotely, and, and you know, depending on how the year progresses, even in person to provide reinforcement and it, enrichment for learning for students. It'll give an opportunity for our students to complete learning activities from the previous learning days that they've had at school. And then really important to, to um, giving our teachers collaboration time to design high quality learning activities and really working to support those collaborative teams that our, our educators have been working in for a number of years. So what would that mean for the student experience? And um, like I mentioned, we've had a group of teachers, paraeducators, administrators, uh, teaching and learning staff working together at elementary, middle school, and high school, and, and they are really close to um, finalizing their products. So we're meeting Monday as a vertical team to share and make sure that we're good with alignment, which they've really done a great job of sharing their work, and it's really exciting. Um, and then Tuesday, we will share all of this information with all of our staff, and our building principals will also give additional professional development time, paid professional development time, and curriculum writing time to our staff so that they have time beyond workshop week to start um, working together in collaborative teams to um, build lessons and use these frameworks to help them as they think about instruction for this next year. So at elementary, students, when they're at school, they would receive direct instruction in what we would call mini lessons for social emotional learning, reading, writing, math, science, social studies. They would have opportunities to participate in small group, individual learning board activities, and then they also have opportunities to do recess and outdoor experiences and then would receive intervention and extension activities. If you remember, the learning boards will continue to be the foundation of learning for all of our students, those families that choose distance learning when we're in hybrid, if we were to go to in-person learning so that there's a consistency for our families and our educators as we navigate this unique year. Students, when they're at home, would view the live mini lessons. So those exact mini lessons, students would be able to connect with their Google Chromebook if that didn't work for families, they will be recorded and they can access those on Seesaw. And then they would have asynchronous or activities that they know about in their learning board to complete. And I'll talk a little bit about how those lessons will be um, put together in the next slide. Um, as I talked to parents, they wanted really clear and, and help in, term, in determining what how to prioritize stuff. And we've really talked about that as a district as we think about our students having time um, at home when they're navigating their learning. On the next slide. So what might learning look like for a middle school or high school student? And this is this is an example of what our um, secondary and really elementary to, they have quite a few pages of, of some example lessons and really trying to show what could this look like if I as an educator have students in multiple buildings. And so it's built off of what's called gradual release. And so if you look at there's direct instruction, which is for students, it's what they need to do supported practice, which is what we as a class do. And then there's must do's that students do by themselves, but it's reinforcing after they've had supported practice from that direct instruction. And then there's can do, meaning students who wanna, um, it's either reteaching, choice-based extension, um, embedded within their learning. And so if you look at this chart, students, this would be the same class. Some students would be in the building, some students would be distance learning, and or the bottom row would be what it would look like if everyone was distance learning. So we are intentionally embedding social emotional learning for all of our students as we think about our teachers are amazing at creating classroom um, environments and most of them have done that for a really long time and it becomes almost second nature. And so how do you do that in a virtual environment? How do you do that when half your class is with you, half your class isn't? And so we really wanted to be intentional about making sure we put time into the lesson, thinking about how can some of our digital platforms help us as we create a classroom community for our students and their educators. So both groups of students would engage in activities that would include some sort of digital component, whether it's a Flipgrid video where you can record a message and everyone can view it, but they would, they would be able to engage in that, students who are in school and students who are home. Then they would do the I do part and the direct instruction. And we've, these groups have done tons of research this summer around blended learning and how to utilize this type of learning in the best way. And so during those 30 minutes, either students would view and do learning that teachers have set up for them in a pre-recorded video, um, doing differentiated reading. They would have time and lessons that are structured that way so that 
the part when they all come together is actually practicing and getting time to really think about and teachers interacting in terms of questioning and seeing how students processed that. And that would be where students come together in the we do. So for the synchronous part, for our students who would be at home, they would connect during those 30 minutes and it wouldn't be 30 minutes to, to necessarily hear a, a direct instruction or a lecture or something like that. It would be about engaging with their classmates who are at school and with their teachers so that their teachers can gauge what they learned in that um, individual video that they viewed or, or however they took them through that direct instruction. Then students would know that they have some must do's that they have to do from that lesson, and then they have some can do's from that lesson. And really teaching them as um, we learned and we, we know students can do a lot more, I think, than many of us realize in terms of being self-directed, but we have to intentionally teach those skills. And we learned a lot about how what supports will help students and how can we scaffold that so that students understand this is what I have to focus on and then these are things that I can do. And a lot of that choice in there in the can do can really help students find places where they shine, where they may not realize and, and get at that level of learning in a way that um, our lessons just, we, we didn't have time to do all this research and think about it as deeply as we've had this summer. So that would be one example. Um, when I tell you those, the committees that have done this work are, they're amazing. And what the work that they've shared with me, I feel really proud of um, engaging in really difficult conversations and trying to figure this out. And so I think it's my responsibility to make sure that I provide resources and remo remove barriers. So we're providing way more professional development than we, time than we ever have. And I, it, it will be a wonderful investment and I know our educators will use it. Um, and so Tuesday that information will go out to our uh, all of our teachers through their principals. And then we're working on a more detailed, a day in the life for our families at home um, so that we can share that on our website. And then in a weekly communication from Dr. Kazmer Tech that comes out so that families can have even more information. But I wanted to show, I've had quite a few questions of like, help me understand when you say that this, this thread through students can access when they're in school and out of school, how is that possible? And um, it is definitely a shift. And so those days on Fridays, um, the time that we make sure that we protect for our teachers to have collaboration time, because they're, they're going to need to work together and they want to work together. So how do we help build that time so that they can, you know, all of our science teachers work together and say, okay, how are we going to structure this lesson? So it's not one individual teacher trying to do all of this themselves. And so we will, we've will. we had great communication. I know it'll continue. Um, I'm learning a lot and I think uh, it, I'm really excited about the um, willingness for everyone to lean in and this type of structure will take us well beyond this next school year. You can go to the next slide. So distance learning, those lesson structures would be the same, but elementary would be Monday through Thursday for both elementary and secondary. There would be live mini lessons again um, in those subject areas, same as hybrid learning. And then the learning boards would serve as the foundation. What would change is some of that extension and intervention and small group activities would be check-ins that were scheduled um, from our educators or we're working on supports on how we can help them schedule those so that we make sure that if we have to move to distance learning at any point that we don't lose out on those supports that we're providing students. Um, I wasn't clear on this last time. So secondary, we're looking at ways to how we're gonna use the schedule. So would it be that students have their whole six period schedule divided on multiple days? Would it be that we look and adjust it throughout the calendar? We have a collaborative um, committee of our building leaders and teacher union um, looking at what that might look like. Either way, students would make sure that they, they saw their teachers in those individual classes twice a week, but they would have synchronous learning expectations all four days during the week. So it's not that they, they wouldn't have that, um, and I wasn't clear about that last time. Again, when students aren't atten attending those digital lessons, they would have um, their can-do and must-do list, list and then have time for those virtual individual check-ins with teachers, small group check-ins, and then Fridays would continue to be those days that teachers would have their time for collaboration and families um, would, we would do small group check-ins, but then students would have time to work on learning from the previous four days of school. So there's been some questions on if I choose distance learning, if we do in fact go to a hybrid model and if I choose distance learning for my student, how can I switch back and forth? And we really wanna work to honor the requests of families if and when 
family situations changed or comfort level or whatever impacted the initial decision that students can come back into school. We obviously need to make sure that we can still maintain a safe environment in terms of class size um, and that social distancing. So there may be a wait time, but our administrators and district leadership will, will work together with the families as, as soon as possible and, and wa want to honor that request. Um, and just Again, if we move toward, forward with the hybrid model, it may be necessary at, um, to switch to the distance learning model. And I know Dr. Kazmierczak will talk about that later. We'll, and we'll attempt to give as much notice as possible because we know that's a significant shift for our families. So when we think about our programs, um, you can go to the next slide, Steve. Our um, activities, high school activities, the state Minnesota State High School League did, did give some guidance on, I believe it was this past Tuesday, where football and volleyball, <laughs> I almost said the wrong sport, football and volleyball moved to the spring. Um, and we're working out some of the additional logistics with our athletic directors um, and we'll continue to communicate. I know they've communicated with coaches and I have Matt St. Martin here with us in case any questions were to come up about that. But we would we would continue throughout the year to follow the guidance from the Minnesota State High School League and they look closely at obviously the guidance from the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health. Community services and recreation are extremely valued in our community um, by us as a district and I know by all of you as you participate and look for those activities for your students and again our goal and their goal is to make sure they offer as many opportunities for our students as long as they can make, remain safe opportunities and follow through the guidance for the Minnesota Department of Health, MDE, and CDC. Um, and if if our students were, if we are in a hybrid model and students choose the, the, the um, distance learning option, they would still be able to participate in athletics and activities. School age care will be um, still available for our families. If we are indeed in a hybrid model or have to move to a distance learning model at any time, we would offer um, child care to our to tier one workers as defined by the Minnesota Department of Education um, at no cost during school days. And then there would be various options for families um, outside of school before and after that would be fee based in both hybrid and distance. You can go to the next slide. And so we'll have more information that will get communicated. And Dr. Kazmierczak will talk about that in a little bit. But this part and portion of it we know is really important, especially as we look to support the essential workers as we navigate a hybrid model um, and or distance learning when and if we have to go to that. All right. I think it's Dr. Kazmierczak. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Allison. And that, so that was uh, Tim Wald, Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations. And, and then uh, you just heard Allison. So Dr. Gillespie is our Assistant Superintendent uh, for Teaching and Learning. So, all right, so our course of action now. Uh, Marissa, I wanna just check with you. Were you going to maybe talk about a couple of things here or are you on the next slide? Can you just- I'm the next couple of slides. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. All right, so we're going to we're going to collect. Uh, so, do you mean starting yep. now? For, forward. Please move forward. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're going to continue to co collect family input. Uh, the the opt-in preference was was sent out. We're going to continue to collect that. Um, we're going to continue to monitor and follow the, the, the learning model parameters provided that I mentioned earlier. So we're going to continue to monitor our data. And then um, we uh, expect board action here today on the learning model for the start of the school year. And so again, that would be that distance learning would be available for all families that choose that. And then um, uh, upon action, uh, the, we would be sending out our return to school plan to staff and families um, once that decision is made. So that could be as you know as soon as today. So we'd be sending that out later on today. Go ahead, Steve. All right. All right. And I can I can take over here and just give a, a few more details about the communication. If you go forward one more, please, Steve. Um, so as Dr. Kazmercheck said, um, assuming that an action is taken today by the school board, we would be communicating with our families today via email, voicemail, and text messages for those 
who have opted into text messages. We'll provide the board meeting video and the presentation, a link to a return to school guide, and then a link to a fall 2020 website that will be live um, as, soon, as soon as decisions are made. And so we'll also provide links to the learning model preference opt-in survey um, that was recently sent out and to a transportation opt-in form that uh, Tim Wald mentioned and would be then launched today with that communication. So the next step for our families would be to continue to provide the input to the preference opt-in survey that we've already sent out. Um, that survey will be open through next Friday, August 14th. Um, additionally, it would be completing an opt-in form to request transportation for those families who would uh, need transportation. And those opt-in requests would be accepted through Sunday, August 16th. Um, additionally, completing the online family update would be important for families to do. That uh, email will be sent out to families and that communication will be sent out to families next week and then watching for additional information to be coming. And we wanted to mention here as well that it's really important for families to ensure that their contact information is correct in Skyward. Um, so it, that it's complete, that we have an email, phone, phone numbers, and um, street addresses are correct. And that the information again is current in Skyward. The um, the mass messaging that we sent out as send out as a school district is directly from Skyward. So if families ensure that their information is available and accurate, current there, um, they will be in the list of getting communications from us. So thank you very much. All right, thanks, Marissa. All right, so. Um, so at that point, we're we're going to turn it over to the board here shortly, but. So just to reiterate, so many families and staff members asked that a decision be made sooner than August 20th, which is what I had indicated at last week's work, um, uh, last week's uh, school board work session. So it makes sense that it's, the decision is made sooner rather than later, given that families and employees need to make myriad decisions in order to gear up for school. So before you is a recommendation to begin the 2020-2021 school year in a hybrid learning model for all students. The recommendation is based on many factors, most prominently the guidance provided by the Safe Learning Plan for 2020-21, which was released last week by Governor Walls. This plan was developed by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Education and is argu arguably the best source of information and guidance for school leaders to navigate the decision on school reopening and as we continue through the school year. The Safe Learning Plan goals are as follows. Uh, number one, prioritize the safety of students and staff. Number two, prioritize in-person learning, especially for younger learners. Uh, three, consider infectiousness and transmission risk among different ages. Four, support planning while permitting flexibility for districts. And five, take into account disease prevalence at a local level. So you heard today about our latest return uh, the school plan that included the safety measures that will be in place as we begin the year. Also included was an update on operational changes that are necessary. You also heard extensively about the hybrid uh, learning model and distance learning model so that families, students, and staff have an understanding of what those options would look like uh, here at the beginning of the year. So this is not a decision that is, uh, this is a decision that is not taken lightly and in today's environment, there's a great deal of division on any topic that we seem to discuss. And this is certainly no different. So I'm confident we've put in, uh, in place a plan using MDH and MDE guidance that provide, uh, prioritize, prioritizes the safety uh, of students and staff. So disease prevalence at the local level was an important factor as we considered this decision. So we reviewed our most recent 14-day COVID-19 case rate by county. And um, I can share those figures again. It was Ramsey County at 19.65, Washington County at 15.65. 6.3 and Anoka at 17.33. So the Ramsey County uh, figure puts us in the recommended policy option based on the 14 day case rate range as elementary in person, middle high school hybrid. So a hybrid model for all students is actually taking a more uh, conservative approach than what the data suggests, although we are very close to that next category, admittedly. Um, Ramsey County daily case rate uh, data suggests that within the next couple of weeks, our 14 day COVID-19 case rate by county will likely trend downward, not upward. Additionally, Ramsey County provides data on the number of cases by zip code and the zip codes that comprise 
the White Bear Lake area schools have a significantly lower case rate than those zip codes in other districts located in the county. Data broken down by city in the county is also favorable for White Bear Lake area schools. We are not an outlier with this recommendation. As of yesterday afternoon, area school districts that are planning to open in a K-12 plus hybrid learning model include Matamidi, Centennial, North St. Paul, Maplewood, Oakdale, Moundsville, Stillwater, South Washington County Schools, and Roseville. So at this time, I will turn it over to um, Mr. Chapman to continue the conversation with, uh, with the school board members. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kasmercheck, and uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Gillespie, Mr. Wald, um, Ms. Vetti, and, and Mr. Mons. Um, at this point, uh, we will have a discussion. Uh, I do want to point out that we also have with us the uh, president of the White Bear Lake uh, Teachers Association, uh, Tiffany Dietrich, and also various administrators, uh, uh, principals and so forth that are participating uh, in this meeting as well. So uh, with that, uh, I guess I will open it up to uh, questions and comments. One thing I would ask of uh, board members and all who participate is to um, please be recognized before you begin uh, talking and also to um, just me be mindful of, uh, of the time that we have um, and uh, that others may uh, may have questions and, and things that they want answered. So let's uh, let's try to be mindful of uh, everybody having a chance to uh, ask or make comments as they uh, desire. With that, I will open it up um, to, um, to any questions or comments from the board um, at all. Ms. Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, in regard to safety and cleaning, will there be additional custodial staff? Um, I'll address that. We have currently posted for additional cleaners, and so we hope that we'll be able to hire some people between now and the time school starts. So um, that's our intention. Okay. And will there be fans allowed in the classrooms? In particular, uh, when it's so hot in September? Yeah, so what we're understanding about the use of fans during this situation is that fans would be, uh, could be used in a classroom. They shouldn't be blowing directly on someone. They should be blowing, you know, uh, against a wall or away from students as a way to circulate air in the class, but they should not be blowing directly on someone. So you're not blowing someone's, you know, uh, breath uh, past another person. Okay, thank you. And then um, I'm concerning food allergies. Are we going to go completely nut free in all of our buildings? I'm thinking about people eating all over the school and currently in our elementary schools, the classrooms are nut free. So if we've got people eating everywhere, how do we make sure that allergies are not uh, harming students? Uh, that's a great question. And it's something that we're working on. Uh, and so if, if we have students eating in classrooms, we'll try to work out students who have nut allergies would be that those classrooms perhaps would be eating in a cafeteria or in a in a different space um, bridget lane is with us and she might have something to add to that bridget you're right yeah definitely tim we've been working with the nurses on this and um, we're currently nut aware in all of the classrooms because it's nearly impossible to guarantee that a student won't bring a nut or nut residue with them um, so like tim mentioned our goal right now is to have highly sensitive uh, students with allergies whether it's nuts or dairy or eggs or whatever it might be working with their nurses um, to determine which classes should be sure to eat in the cafeteria or a space other than their class classroom. Okay, thank you. Um, if quarantine becomes necessary, then will that impact all teachers and students who've come into contact with that person so that all of those people will need to quarantine for 14 days? I can take that question. So that's where we would work with MDH in order to determine high and low risk contacts and work to get individualized notices out to each of the affected stakeholders, be they students or be they staff members. So the answer is it's more nuanced um, than that, but we'd look at 
all of the, we look at the entirety of that situation. There's exhaustive interviewing that happens as part of that to make the right determination in that case. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions for Dr. Gillespie. Um, when, when we're talking about partnering in small group work in elementary school, um, how are we going to ensure that these littles keep their distance and maintain sanitation um, when they're, you know, six, seven, eight years old? Because I agree that partner in small group work is so important, but how are we going to ensure that? We're going to have to teach them, you know, what that looks like now. And so um, we really have talked with as administrators, and I know they're talking on these committees about that, but when we think about the skills we're trying to build for students, how do they look differently now? So it could very well be that you are still in two desks sitting, you have to still be six feet apart, but you both have your device and then maybe one of your friends is on a screen like we're doing right now and you're collaborating that way and doing partner work and then it's the protocols that you teach the students. But it, it is going to have to be partnering social distancing and partnering those safeties with the skill that you're trying to develop for the student and then being creative on what that looks like because it it is, as you know, it's not the way where any of us are used to. So, um in looking at the model of the five different steps, the social, emotional, the I do, we do, are teachers going to be restructuring their entire curriculum then to fit these things? I mean, if they've generally done simulations in the past um, for certain subjects, is that going to mean that they're going to shift their curriculum to fit into that structure? Um, there will be some shifting. I would not say their entire curriculum. And really, that's where they would work together as a collaborative team. And so each level has developed a framework and, and some tight expectations and then loose expectations. And, and the tight for all of them is that the, our teachers are collaborating with each other. And so, again, we have some questions that will help them think about, we did this in the spring too, what are those essential skills that you're trying to you know, teach students and build from, and then what does that look like? But our teachers have amazing things that they've created, and I have no doubt that they'll have to tweak them in our current situation, but it, it, it would not be a complete rebuilding of their curriculum. Okay, and then my final question is, if we have teachers who don't feel comfortable being in the buildings, Will they be allowed to teach in a distance learning model entirely? Um, I'll take that question as well. And so in that case, um, I do not anticipate that we will have enough remote teaching opportunities to accommodate all of the requests that we may have. And so we're going to be taking that on a case-by-case -case basis. The first individuals that we would anticipate working with in that manner would be those um, who need an accommodation that's been documented. And so we'd work with those individuals first on a case-by-case -case basis in order to fill any potential roles that we would have that would be available for remote working. So that's what that's how we'd go through that process. Um, however, the answer, because I do want to be clear, is that no, we would not anticipate that we would have a role like that for any interested staff member. Okay, thank you. Okay, other other questions, comments? Okay, Ms. Thompson. All right, uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right, um, I guess my first question, I have a couple. Um, I would like to kind of piggyback on one of Ms. Ellison's questions. Maybe Dr. Gillespie could answer this. Uh, what does the social emotional curriculum look like? I might have to lean on my elementary principal friends, but I know at elementary school, they use a curriculum called Second Step. And so they've taught many lessons, either some through morning meeting, others through direct school-wide instruction around the skills and thinking about each week, focusing on a skill and a theme throughout the week. I don't know, Dan Schmidt, I don't want to put, put you on the spot, but if there's other details, secondary, um, we're still working. There's an advisory curriculum that they do at middle school, and then we're implementing BAR as a brand new pro program at um, North Campus that really has an amazing social and emotional curriculum that we're looking at. It will completely be embedded in, in ninth grade. And then how, how do we build upon those skills for 10th through 12th grade? Okay. 
Um, I just took part in a summer session with the MSBA and they had a, um, a psychologist on there speaking about, you know, some of these um, mental health issues that we may be seeing in our schools as students start to come back in and uh, putting that pressure, uh, added pressure onto our staff who is already, you know, we all know that this is not uh, going to be a normal school year and there's going to be added um, issues that we're all going to have to deal with. And just wondering, um, I know that, you know, we don't have the funding probably to hire more counselors or school psychologists. Um, how do we see uh, supporting our staff so that they're not um, put, the burden isn't all put on them if there are, you know, higher needs in the classroom or something I don't know how to word it the right way, but. Um, how to make sure our staff are supported as they support our students who will undoubtedly have lots of things going on. Yes, and I think even our staff will obviously have their own uh, mental health issues that they will need to be dealing with and how will we be su supporting them? So absolutely on both of those. So we have a really great foundation. We we started in the spring in terms of wraparound services with our bear care clinic and our support line um, and just different outside resources, weekly emails that went to staff, um, you know, around different resources that are out there. Additionally, we've talked about having once we finalize what our model looks like, putting together um, professional development for staff around, um, I was, I too was just on a call thinking about how do you support your staff in terms of tra trauma-informed instruction. People often think of our students, and of course that's what it, what it, that is usually where it, where it goes, but there's tons of trauma-informed practices for staff in terms of how to help them and their own anxiety they may feel throughout the day or, or just navigating some really Difficult, super difficult times for all of us. Um, additionally, we have our counselors on site and we developed a multi-tiered system of support. And so we have a structure K-12 on what that looks like in terms of how do our support teams look at students and um, really analyze so we don't have students falling through the cracks. And our, our schools did an amazing job in the spring. And so then how do we build upon that and creatively use um, some of our you know different things that we've used or different staff in a different way in terms of that could be an area that, like Mr. Mon said, we have some extra support staff that maybe can't be at school, but we need them to help and make sure they're checking in individually. Or that would be where we would look at and say, okay, how do we beef up this multi-tiered system of support so that we can support our students in class? And so our educators are not alone in that and our wraparound services and how our administrators navigate that is our, a consistent, um, support that we're providing. Additionally, in our student support services department, um, Lisa Oren and her team are continually looking at social emotional support and how do they work with our leaders to make sure that's enhanced. And so the balance of offering professional development and teaching different skills and then making sure we have those support systems in school. Great. And Chair Chapman, may I just add to that response briefly? Absolutely. absolutely. So just in addition to that, I just want to state that, you know, building community has never been more important than it's going to be during this time and making sure there's open lines of communication. We have tools right now, but no, by no means are they always a fit, are they always comprehensive? So we have an employee assistance program. Um, you know, we have other channels of reaching out. That said, it's certainly going to be my plan that we're going to be working incredibly closely. Um, with our with our staff leaders as well to recognize all of the resources that we could possibly put into play here. So um, working with Ms. Dietrich, working with um, all of our all of our leaders amongst our employee groups to ensure that um, we're not missing things and that we're accessing all the resources at our disposal is going to be incredibly important. And uh, and those lines of communication are something that I think we've done a pretty good job of keeping open um, through the spring and summer. And we certainly wouldn't plan on um, letting any of that fall through the cracks moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, this would probably go back to Dr. Gillespie also. Um, I have had a few um, personal conversations with some staff and then obviously all the emails we've all been receiving. Um, and I, there have been some concerns on the subject of the live streamed lessons. And so I guess it'd be best if maybe I just 
read a couple things where they state it better than I could um, possibly state it, but they have some privacy concerns about like special ed students or students who may be in their classroom who um, have media release, um, you know, where they don't want their children to be on that. Um, and then they just feel like the live videos um, may pose more, more problem than be helpful. Um, kind of from my own experience last year with the distance learning, um, you know, there were, there were issues just with the Google Classroom meets that my elementary daughter took part in. Um, and I could see that the live streaming could also pose some issues. Um, so teachers are concerned, you know, that their voices won't be heard, they'll be wearing masks, they may be muffled if a student in the classroom acts out or has, you know, um, some kind of issue during the stream that that would be, you know, so everybody would see it. Um, so I guess there's some concern around uh, the, live, the live streaming. So has this something that you guys, I'm sure you've thought about it, but if you could speak to it perhaps. For sure, yeah. Um, so if, if I'm hearing you correctly, really I hear two different concerns. One, um, behaviors and or, um, you know, behaviors, whether it's misbehavior by a student and or behaviors associated with a student who, who may be receiving special services. And um, what we found is that concern Really, our students are together when we're face to face in school with all of our all. They're seeing all of those different behaviors all the time in school, and so while it's it, it's a different way of learning and and having that screen in there changes things for the adults. It, it really we didn't find that it was an issue for for the students, and so you know I. I know anytime I say that blanket statement, there's always one or two exceptions and we would work as administrators with that exception to try to figure out, you know, what is the barrier? Maybe it is that that student, for whatever reason, couldn't participate in the live stream, but was someone who viewed the recordings. Um, and so that's where I think the expectation and teaching kids the skills if and when you run into those barriers. But often it's, it's our own fear of, um, you know, one, it's heightened right now and for all of us because of what we're living through, but it's really that change and how can I, um, how do I make sure as a teacher I have the skills so that I know how to navigate that. And so, you know, th that will be that back and forth communication, but we, you know, our kids are, are really, honestly, sometimes the younger, the youngest kids do the best with that stuff. And um, really, we learned a lot around those small groups and how beneficial they can be. So our structure this time around really tries to have more opportunities for the smaller groups. But I would say it ends up being more of an adult concern than actually what we see in practice for students. I think that's kind of more of the, you know, what parents who are watching with their students at home, how they may perceive it, I think was mainly one of the concerns. Um, obviously, I'm sure if there's major issues with it, it'll be reconsidered, you know, as a lot of things I'm sure are going to be reconsidered as we, as we go down this road together. Um, I guess my next question may be for Mr. Wald. Um, I'm not sure who would answer this one, but uh, what will consequences be for families who um, don't follow the requirements as far as you know, ensuring that if they know their student has a temperature before they get them on the bus and they send them anyways. Um, if, you know, their student comes to school and um, wears the mask all the way here, but then, you know, at some point in the day decides to take it off or to, um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that this can lead into. I'm sure you understand where I'm going with this. Perhaps you could just um, maybe speak to what those requirements will be for the students and what will happen if the family and the students don't um, follow it or will there be like a, you know, one strike, two strike system? Thanks. Uh, I think we're gonna be work, administrators in our buildings will be working with families to set a tone and in setting norms for wearing masks in school and certainly those things will be challenged, whether it be a family or an individual student. And so we'll be setting norms in our schools. And then we'll, we'll be working with individuals and families to work through it as they come up. We recognize that this is going to be an adjustment and, and maybe a stressor for some of our families. 
And so we have to be patient and work with them to make sure we get there. Uh, you know, an option may be to transition a student to distance learning if they're not able to be, to follow the rules. Um, but excluding students from a learning environment, you know, is a pretty important decision. So we just want to really work positively with families to try to get to a place where students can be successful following the rules and expectations. I can add, uh, maybe Angela, if you could mute my, could you mute my talk? Okay, uh, I could add that um, we just received a draft of a policy related to this as well from MSBA. So it's likely something we would want to adopt. It spells out some of the steps we would need to take if, if we run into issues. So that guidance just came out. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna let some others have questions since I see our time is, um, is you know, uh, going by quickly and I'm sure you know, Miss Ellison already hit a bunch that I had, so maybe some others will have some of the ones that I have. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Um, Dr. Newmaster, you're next on the list. Thank you. I will start with what I think is the simplest one. I have questions in three different areas. The first one is, as we know, the addition of good ventilation or doing activities outside is a plus. And I remember from my time in teaching in school, if I took my German class out to play soccer or to do something outside, it was pretty relaxed in the olden days. As schools became more hardened and organized and in and out, I'm just wondering if you've got a protocol, and I'm thinking of inside rooms at North Campus in hot weather, maybe you wanna take your communications class A day or C day, whatever, outside. Have you thought about that kind of movement in the hall? Is it gonna be formalized or can people announce to the office they're taking their 12 or 15 students outside? Well, as it stands today, teachers oftentimes take students outside for learning activities. And we we ask that they report to the office if they're leaving the building, so we're aware of it. And we'd expect that to be the, the same. I think we'd encourage teachers to be outside with kids when that's appropriate and possible and the weather permits and it's the right learning, learning space. So yeah, I think we'd encourage that. Okay, that's a good answer. I was hoping it wouldn't be such a strict hall usage thing. When it's not passing time, would be a good time to maybe take them outside. My other question, my second question, deals with electives because that's my other background besides the media center. I taught German and I always think of electives. There's always an amount of movement for electives, whether they're middle school or high school and you've got special teaching things that you're going to use in your classroom unless we've gone to everything on the Chromebook screen. Um, and some electives have pullouts like lessons. So I'm thinking of, have we cut down on electives that are so important for motivating kids to like going to school sometimes? No, we haven't cut down on our electives or our schedule remains the same um, in terms of what students registered for and the courses that are offered. I would say our, our educators are innovative and amazing and really thinking of different ways to make sure their classes um, continue to be really engaging for students but are safe. And so um, I've worked very briefly with music. I know our principals have reached out and talked with different electives trying to figure out what our schedulers are working on it. And so it's a team effort, but obviously the educators are the content experts. And so they'll work within the guidelines and be creative and team together and think about it, but they're extremely valuable in our system and for our kids and families. So we haven't shrunk down the amount of time that someone may have chosen an elective. And I know music probably best besides language, I guess, but music is one of my special things I think about a lot. And I'm thinking of the person with the 50 person band or your big choir. And I know they're all very creative, but that's got some special considerations. Yeah, no, we haven't shrunk down, but they have for obviously have been impacted. Um, I would say they're really 
creative. We all benefited from seeing some of those digital concerts that they did right. and all that. But um, it's not the same in terms of when they're able to be face to face, but it's not because we've limited the time or changed anything in our schedule. Mm -hmm. The marching band will be spaced six feet apart. Um, I guess I'm also thinking of our important career path electives and all of their hands on. Now there'll be a small class, but again, that was just getting really rolling and really lit a fire in some of our kids that may not have been as engaged before. So how are we doing with that path? Same exact, they're being amazingly amazingly creative. Their classes will continue. They will, you know, I have no doubt they'll have to figure out usage of some of those machines and maybe not have part, you know, partners the way they may have before. I know they had, um, they did some things in construction. Um, Dan Rossiter did this summer outside and was able to still offer the Minnesota Trades Academy. And so, um, you know, being really creative and trying to make sure we offer those opportunities for our students. Well, that's hopeful. And and I have read, whoever is listening, hundreds of emails, and I understand lots of concerns, but I am in, at least impressed with how many angles people have been looking at. Now I'm transitioning to my third section, and this is as we look at the model, and by going hybrid, we're right on the corner of everybody being required to be hybrid anyway with the 19 and a half if 20 is still the, the edge where a district would do the hybrid schedule or they could do distance and it looks like we've got an option. What I'm just wondering as we plan, because Lord knows, we don't know, maybe we'll go up, maybe we'll go down, you know, if we're hopeful like some, we'll have a vaccine soon, but how do we transition to another model? What's our protocol set? Um, and that might be caused by a sudden outbreak in which our count would go up. Are we gonna just look at the school or the district? I'm sure we've got a protocol we're looking at and maybe that's a Kazmierczak question. I think it might be, Dr. Master. <laughs> You're top of the chain. <laughs> um. So um, just to clarify, so the, the cutoff of at, um, the different numbers, um, the, the mark of 20, so 20 to 30 indicates both hybrid. So we're not, mm -hmm. yep, and then 30, 30 would be elementary hybrid, middle high school distance. So that, that just to clarify that the 20 is the cutoff for hybrid for both. Um, so, so yeah, th this is a, that's a good question. We're, um, you know, I've been on many superintendent calls and we all wonder how that would, how we would transition and we've had good conversations about that. But the key is that we, we aren't alone in that conversation and in that decision because there are, there's going to be regional support teams that help, um, help superintendents and, um, work through that scenario. And there, there would likely be a, a break between, um, uh, you know, a, a shift in a model. There's time built in. When you need to, when you need to change, I believe it's five, up to five days where it still would count as student contact time, but it would allow a system to work towards transitioning to a different model. Um, and that's undoubtedly going to be happening throughout the state of Minnesota, and it certainly could here. But yeah, there's, there's support in place to help guide districts through that. So we're never alone. We're in consultation with these regional teams. Uh, put together by um, Department of Health, Department of Ed. Uh, it would be at our regional, um, the Metro Exu, the Metro Educational Cooperative. Do I understand correctly that if, let's say we don't want to ever be in the problems that some of the Southern schools have been in recently, but let's say there's a big outbreak. Are you saying that they give up to five days to transition? That you wouldn't say, you know, there was a, yeah. a great big swim party or something and lots of people are testing positive. Yeah, so I think the takeaway is that there is time to transition in between. And also, yeah, I know, oh, another thing you asked was, is it a whole district decision or is it a school-based decision? Right. It's not necessarily a full school district decision uh, based, because there, there could be 
you know, there could be a school lo located in a certain area that that might see a spike and in working with local, um, you know, health officials, there might be a determination that, that that might have to take a different approach. And with us spread out somewhat geographically, that 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 is potentially uh, something that could happen here. Mm -hmm. hmm. But it isn't a it isn't a one size fits all, even within a, the same system. Okay, and I guess I just wondered what the transition is. I mean, I did see that some districts actually changed the model they'd already announced, and the kids aren't in school yet, so it's not quite as urgent. But there's still a time, I guess, for daycare, and that and that leads to my last question. I guess we're providing out of school care for tier one that need it, free. Tier two that requests it with a fee. Do we still have the after school program that's just open to any parents? Uh, yes, we still have hope. Oh. Yeah, I could take that quick. Yeah, Dr. Newmaster, yeah, before and after school care will be available for all families like it always has been given the, um, the in person model, hybrid model, and then option for those families if we go distance as well. Yep. So you say before and after school for the kids that aren't in person, say they're Monday, Wednesday, they could have the daycare then for Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? Yep. So we have those surveys out to families now to gauge that, uh, what that need is right now and what that desire would be for those families. And we'll have to determine, uh, take a lot of things into consideration as we determine what that availability will be. But yeah, for our tier one employees, we are, it's written in the, in the planning guide that school districts must provide a, um, you know, a, a, a school age care program for those tier one children during the school day on their off days, if we do a hybrid. Well, I'm thinking tier one, tier two, others, yep. that might impact the, you can only have one bus address. Very complicated, but mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yep. That answers what I needed to know today. So okay. I, I will give the gavel on or the question on to someone else. The okay. baton. Thank you, Dr. Dumaster. Uh, at this <laughs> at this time, I uh, Tiffany Dietrich, Ms. Dietrich, the uh, president of the uh, White Bear Lake Teachers Association, has requested to speak. Uh, Ms. Dietrich. Thank you, Vice Chair Chapman. Good afternoon, Dr. Kazmierczak and members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. First, let me say I know how hard everyone is working right now and how impossible this situation is. There are no easy answers and many potential pitfalls. Your work is commendable during these difficult times. Clearly the most difficult I have encountered in my 24 years as a language arts educator. One of my favorite lines from literature is you never really understand someone until you step into their shoes. While I'm happy to answer any of your specific questions this afternoon, I'd first like to invite you to step into the shoes of the educators of our district as they prepare to dive back into teaching during a pandemic. This time is typically one of excitement for educators as we prepare to reunite with the students and families we serve. This year, for a majority of those I represent, that excitement has been replaced by myriad emotions that keep them up at night. As they lie awake, they think of their students and families whom they deeply miss. They remember the messiness of crisis teaching last spring, despite their tireless work. They visualize their classrooms and how they will look amid the confines of strict social distancing and the safety protocols necessary to preserve everyone's safety. They search for ways to ensure success for their students while teaching in person and online, while scrubbing and cleaning and supporting their students in all the ways that educators will be asked to do. They consider the complex web of interactions we all experience every day. The fact that each of their students will head home to their families at the end of the day, and that each of their family members will have had a complex web of interactions that day too. They worry that placing these complex webs in schools puts everyone at undue risk, their students, their families, their loved ones, themselves. I value what Governor Walls has tried to do 
In an impossible situation, our state has responded the best that it can by offering a plan grounded in science and allowing for local control. Yet the decision you are being asked to make today isn't just about science. It isn't just about education. It's about public safety. It's about coming together as a community to ensure that all of our students and teachers and their families can continue to learn and grow far into the future. As a proud bear of 24 years, I've watched this community come together and support one another through challenging times. During this most difficult of times, we must come together to make things good here in White Bear Lake. In fact, not just good, exceptional. We can and must do better for our students and their families, and our educators are ready to dig in. Crisis teaching during distance learning is not the same as the well-designed, student-focused remote instruction with critical supports that must be foundational to all learning this year. We don't know when we will need to move among the three models that Governor Walls has outlined in the months ahead. That is why the majority of members I represent, nearly 70%, believe that it is everyone's benefit to fully invest in preparing for that reality first through a remote start before adding hybrid learning to the mix. A remote start through September would allow us to design and refine this critical educational infrastructure. It will provide stability for families while we monitor the numbers and learn from those around us. It will provide both safety and comfort as we experience the 80 and even 90 degree days of autumn. No matter what is decided here this afternoon, its success depends upon the strength of the Wiper Lake community and the degree to which we come together to prioritize public safety in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dietrich. Uh, Ms. Beloyd, I must apologize. I had you on the list and inadvertently skipped over it to you. So accept my deepest apologies. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, all right. Um, so my first question, um, this would be for, for Dr. Gillespie. So we've decided on sort of an AB, AB model. Um, what's the thinking behind doing that as opposed to doing A, 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 B, B? It, to me, it would seem um, that it would be easier to do contract tracing if you had one group of students in for two days in a row, um, as opposed to going back and forth between days. So we discussed that, um, the AABB, and really with the cleaning that um, at night that Dr. Or Dr. Uh, Mr. Wald talked about really um, helped in between those groups. And the concern was, as we looked at it, the number of days that students then would be without being in school. So if you did AABB, there'd be five days each time that students wouldn't have contact with teachers or be at school. And so trying to balance that, um, it, yeah. That, that was our original, and that's why that this is part of that proposal, really trying to figure out um, balancing all of that. I uh, would have to default to my colleagues who have dealt more with the MDH in terms of the contact tracing, because I I, I haven't dealt with that as much, but um, really that they're, they're still in those, those cohorts, so I would imagine that they can still, you know, they would still follow the same procedure, but that was the discussion, that's why we didn't. Okay. Um, what is, what are we going to do about subs? This, I, that question kept coming up over and over again. And I know this last year we've had tons of problems just getting subs in during regular times. Um, how are we going to address that going forward? I'll take that. Um, so Deb, we're going to look at multiple approaches to addressing that. Um, first of all, we have been recruiting through the summer. Um, however, we absolutely do expect that there will be challenges um, in maintaining our sub pool to the extent that we would like to. So we're looking at a number of different um, options and opportunities that we can explore. Um, we mm -hmm. are posting for um, district-wide daily subs um, who, and so we're hoping to, in addition to our normal, to our normal exercise of maintaining a healthy sub pool, we're also looking to hire new highly qualified substitutes. They'll be available on a daily basis in order to step into critical roles. 
um, and uh, we're looking to staff that aggressively. So um, we're looking at that. We're looking at model changes. How, how does this work and what other opportunities are available in a hybrid model um, to exercise? We certainly came up with some creative solutions through the spring as we, as we came across those challenges. It will be more difficult in a hybrid setting than it was in a distance learning model um in, in many respects but we're going to work really hard and we also just need to say it's going to have to be an all hands on deck approach so um we're going to have to be utilizing all of the employees that we have um, at our disposal in order to fill those those gaps where they appear how has that hiring been going um that's a new posting here and so we're looking um we're looking at that right now um and trying to, to ensure that we're expanding our sub pool um as we're making those hires so um we'll, we'll see in about two weeks here how that how that is shaped up okay um mr wald what is the monitoring kit you referred to um lisa warren are you on yes i'm on you want to address that? Of course. So one of the things that we're trying to do is not have students that are exhibiting symptoms go down to the health office and be triaged there. So we're creating grade level kits that have an infrared thermometer. They have student masks, additional student masks in them, uh, gloves and uh, different, just different things so that they're right there available to the teachers. And then we'll, we'll are creating a communication system down to the office then where the health uh, assistants and nurses would know that the students were coming down. And then we've created what we call more like zones of where students are getting picked up and they're being triaged and we're keeping them out of the health office so that we can continue to do our safe practices in there and not expose some of the students. So that's our thought behind having some of that work be back in the grade level. Okay. Uh, and, and since you answered that question. Um, are IEPs going to have to be redone this year since we're going to be moving between models and um, those things are going to look very different for, for the students that have those? Yeah, so we did that last year. Um, what we were looking at is we're trying to change the IEPs based on the students presenting needs versus on the model of education. So we're gonna go into the school year assuming that the student, uh, I, the student's IEP is gonna be implemented as is. And then as we get to see the student in their different environments, we'll be meeting with the family and we'll be changing those goals um, for whatever new needs might arise. Okay. Um, do we know what the school hours are going to be? Because if we're, we're, we're tacking on an hour at the end of the day for for student or for teacher prep time, correct? So what would the hours of school be? They would, oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember, I don't have those numbers in front of me at this moment. Um, we are pushing some busing up. One, uh, one area specific to South Campus is we're gonna be able to bus South Campus independently. Typically we've bused South Campus students uh, with North Campus students in the morning and middle school students in the afternoon. But we're going to try to keep those students separated on buses. So that's going to mean about 15 minutes early in the um, at South Campus. Um, Mike Torito, are we, is that adjustment, what is it at, at the other schools? Yeah, um, let me get in here. I can uh, kind of go over. It looks like we're going to do a 60 minute earlier release at all of our sites and buildings at that time. So kind of like the elementaries would look at a 240 dismissal. Um, I think it's a 202 or two o'clock at the middle school. North campus is more like a 115, somewhere in there, if that sounds right, I believe. And school start times? They stay the same. The only one that would change would be the South Campus. And ALC. And ALC, because those two yeah. would be going together. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay. Um, do we know what the classrooms are going to look like? I've, we've gotten several questions from, from teachers wanting to know, are they going to have to take personal items out of the room? Are students going to be allowed to use the books that are in the rooms? Uh, how, how is that going to look? 
Um, well, I'll address part of that. Uh, so we have a lot to a, a lot of work to do yet on capacity in each room. Um, we're working with the fire marshal recommendations and the six foot distancing guidelines. And so Kevin Klecker, our safety coordinator, um, has provided guidance to principals on um, what they should be working with. And then as we have built-ins in classrooms, that'll reduce capacity a little bit. So um, continue to, continuing to work on that. Uh, in terms of books and resources like that, um, I don't know if we have the answer to that one yet. We've got, that will be one of those things we're going to need to figure out yet, unless somebody else wants to chime in, but I think we need to figure that one out yet. Okay. Um, are the, will the COVID teams have tests on site, like the rapid tests? No, no, they would not. But we would be able to be partnering with um, MDH to figure out where the best testing sites would be. And then we assist our employees in accessing that, whether that be um, trying to find where their appointments are available or those types of things. Okay. And are we going to be bringing the teach if we decide to go with um, this model, are we going to be bringing the teachers in early to do planning? How, how is that going to be handled? So we won't be bringing them in per se, but we'll be giving up um, 32 hours per teacher to work per, per full time teacher to work collaboratively with their collaborative teams through their um, principals. So they'll have an additional, it would equal four days then that they beyond workshop week. We've also talked with um, our principals. Normally workshop week is a balance between district professional development and building professional development. There will be a, um, we will, um, for sure, less district professional development so that more time can be given to the principals and their staff to make sure that they have enough time um, to collaborate and work together to feel good to start the year. And then those Fridays will be critical. So um, based on the surveys that the people have, people have already filled out for whether or not they're planning to do distance learning alone and using the, the AB model that we have, do we know how many students or do we have a rough idea of how many students we're going to be planning on in the building on those days? Are we are we less than 50% of our students each of those days? The principals are working on the direct logistics, but as we worked and calculated thinking about different structures, they would naturally be smaller because you would still divide in those groups and then families who chose um, to stay home, those students would still access their classes. So I know you know, some of it, when you divide in those groups, the principals are tweaking. So it's not obviously a perfect alphabet mix in terms of those classes. And so I know it's nuanced, but the six feet enforcement is what is the guidance for those classes. So that would be the um, the flex room. And they're, you know, obviously try to make and balance them and make them as small as we can. So do we feel comfortable that that social distancing can happen in all of our rooms? Yes, we do. Yeah, they'll as schedules we'll be working on as we identify students who aren't who are going to be in a social in a um, distance learning mode. Then there's going to be a lot of balancing of classrooms to get those numbers balanced out because you might have um, some larger classes might have fewer students choose distance learning, and so then we've got to move students around and make sure we can balance them out and fit within the spaces that we have. But that will be uh, quite a process that's going to occur over the next month. Really, all the way up till school starts, we'll be refining those schedules. Okay. And then my last question is, um, how are we going to handle passing time? Is that going to be increased? Or are we going to have a, a staggered uh, classroom let go and, you know, this, this floor goes now? On the, how is that going to be handled? Yeah, all the principals are working on it and it won't be passing time like it's been before. So it might on a, a bell schedule look like it's staggered, but it's it's so that buildings, our high schools are divided in zones and areas. And so they'll release certain ones. Students won't be using lockers. Um, middle school will go from one class to the other, but it's not a passing time where students will hang out by lockers and have minutes to socialize. It'll really be truly going from one class to the other, so. So do we plan on the students then carrying like their backpacks class to class if they're not going to use lockers? Yep, they would have their stuff with them. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you, Ms. Beloyd. Um, Dr. Newmaster, uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you. My brain is still on electives as I think of the school day being shortened. To me, this looks like that three period block then that we thought about and saw what it was gonna do to electives. Um, so if we start with this shortened school day, are all of our students starting with less choice? I mean, they aren't gonna have the same number of classes, correct? No, they will have the same number of classes. We're adjusting our bell schedule. So that's still being worked out, but our, they will still have the same number of classes. So when you think about a traditional block schedule that you were used to, it actually changed the complete configuration of how our schedule is. We'll, at the high school and middle school, we'll still continue with that. The classes that are offered, they're working on how often will those classes meet. And let's say it's three classes in a day, those three classes would still meet it wouldn't mean that they wouldn't have those other three. It could be an alternating schedule. It could be alternating weeks. They're still looking at multiple different options. And so it would still, they would adjust the bell schedule. So when it's block, maybe they're 90 minute blocks so that they can get all three. Um, so they will not eliminate classes. They'll adjust the bell schedule to make sure that all, all six classes that students registered for are able to be met, that, you know, they meet and when they determine how often those classes will meet throughout the quarter or year, however the schedule works out. However long we need to stay in this unusual circumstance. Um, and again, you have to salute the teachers who are had wonderful classes that are gonna be chopped in incredibly creative ways. So I'm glad you're not cutting it, but what do you do about college and the schools classes that have a distinct thing you have to do? I have a senior I've talked to that has said, I might as well take them all up at Century because they're open for registration. Co so what are you doing about college in the schools? They That's will be inflexible. It is. So the, the instructors will follow the guidelines of the schools that they work with within our schedule that once it's determined. And so, you know, the curriculum isn't as flexible and what that looks yeah. like, but, um, they'll navigate it. They had to do the same thing in the spring. There was maybe a little bit more flexibility, but I don't think much more. So, um, yep, you're right. They'll, but they'll, they'll navigate it in our schedule and, um, undoubtedly we'll problem solve with them. Cause once we, we finalize our schedule and what that looks like, there'll be nuanced things that we have to figure out within our system and how do we problem solve that? But we're proud of those classes and, um, and the work that we've done to make sure our students take advantage of them. So we'll provide all the supports we possibly can and it will require all of us to think in ways that we haven't ever thought before yet. Um, and well, and I, think, I think some of the kids are thinking in ways they've never thought before too. So, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, okay, well, how did we finish, what percent, if you have it, of kids that were in college in the schools classes finished them and completed them as if they had been taking them banded up distance, whether it was at Century or the U of M too. I don't have that, but I will absolutely get it for you and share it with you. It would you. be interesting because mm -hmm. we had a great program going. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Newmaster, Dr. R. Kand. Thank you, Vice Chair Chapman. I just have a couple of questions. Um, I want to I want to confirm that if a teacher gets exposed and has to go into quarantine, they will not have to use their uh, sick time for the 14 days they're out that we have another another fund or something that they can use. Is that correct? That is correct, Dr. Arkan. They will not need to um, access their sick time um, for that. Uh, and again, um, our plan for that does go beyond um, state and federal mandates. So um, we feel that that's incredibly important to incentivize that our staff take care of themselves and don't feel a burden when they're doing so. And so if I am exposed, let's say by a family member and not in school, I still can use that to encourage me not to come in for the 14 days. That's correct. You'd provide us documentation from a third party um, stating that that exposure had happened and that and um, they would also supply us with the recommended um, quarantine timeline 
uh, and then we would operate under that under that timeline. Correct. Thank you. Uh, I have another question about some of our pre-K sp students with special needs. They need special services, and if we go to a distance learning, does that mean that they can no longer, let's say, get my speech therapy? Uh, they won't be able to come in and get that. Is that correct? Uh, this is Lisa Oren. Yes, for our early childhood special ed students, we would go to the distance learning model, but we would provide it through, similar to what we did in the spring, we would do it through distance learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and the kind of last question, either if we're in distance learning or hybrid, we are going to provide childcare services. So we're asking a portion of our employees to come in and work no matter what model we're in. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's exactly how we worked through the spring. Okay. So we have some experience with working with, with students and especially maybe some younger kids um, and working through that model. So we've got uh, some experience that we can fall back on. That's correct. Okay. And then finally, my final question is, is as we're moving forward, and I'm thinking of the high school, uh, secondary high school, um, we're, you're giving them times where they can maybe create bridging activities. And uh, maybe I create a distance learning activity that I can also use in the classroom. So no matter whether we're hybrid or we have to transition quickly to distance learning, I don't have to miss a beat. I can continue on where I'm at with that and, and, and continue to move forward. And that's kind of what I'm hearing. Absolutely, yes. All right. Um, I think that's the questions I have, uh, Vice Chair Chapman. I'll return the floor to you. Thank you, Dr. Arcan. Ms. Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I've got a question regarding our specialist teachers and classes. Um, I've heard that they won't be taking place uh, in the hybrid model in the in-person um, version of that. Is, is that true? And if so, um, I guess, how are we managing our specialist classes to make sure that we're utilizing those teachers and that kids are experiencing those as well? The intention is absolutely to have specialist classes. The principals are going to partner with the specialist in September to create what that schedule looks like. And so wanting to, there's various guidance of things that maybe would be better to offer distance um, and wanting to use those content experts as um, collaborative partners in determining that schedule. So we won't start out with specialist classes. They'll work on that before we pull them into the, into the academics. Yep. Um, and then in the passing time, uh, is it true, I guess, first that in the secondary programs, classes may be 110 minutes long? Is that what we're hearing? Um, I'm not exactly sure the minutes. I have a couple of secondary principals. I don't know, Catherine or Christina, you know? Yeah, it's going to be in that ballpark, yes. Okay. And so currently with just a, in a normal environment, um, kids don't have very much time to utilize the bathroom during their passing time. It's, it has been a concern of mine um, prior to this. Um, how do we plan on ensuring that all of our students who are in the building will have the appropriate time to go to the bathroom? And obviously we'll need to make sure people are properly washing their hands. And in order to do that, according to, you know, the recommended guidelines for how long you should be washing your hands properly, how are we going to manage all those pieces and ensure that our students um, feel comfortable, you know, saying, hey, you know, I have to use the bathroom in the middle of, of the 110 minute long class um, without them feeling um, like they shouldn't ask, I guess. I'll attempt and my colleagues feel free to correct me. What I would say is we'll have to create a different norm and so it won't happen during passing time and so how you how you teach kids and help them understand the safest way to use the restroom and this is how you know before 
our, our mental model as professionals was you use the bathroom during passing time. That has to flip. So how do we help our teachers think about the procedures in their classes to ensure safety and then in teaching the students the skills? So it's it's it'll be like that at every level. It's a complete a different mindset in terms of how we've navigated those things. So we have to intentionally talk about that with our students so that they understand that the, the expectations are different now. Okay. Because I know I, from my own children's experience, uh, sometimes they just don't even feel comfortable. They will wait till they come home to go to the bathroom just because they don't have enough time in the passing time. And then once they're in class, it doesn't always feel like they can leave the classroom or it's, you know, I'm not sure how to say that. Um, if I've heard some stuff that there may be up to 20 students per classroom, that to me doesn't seem like a 50% um, capacity, you know, a model. Yeah, I don't know where that would occur. And so I know one person expressed some concerns looking at her current class list, but that class list is, you know, that that's a premature look. So right now, alphabetically, classes don't divide equally. So it's very possible if you set L as your dividing point, LM as your dividing point, as a class look as a class list in progress looks today, that would be uneven. That's the work that will occur over the next month to balance those out. So we don't end up with a section of 32 that has 20 one day and 12 the next. We'll be uh, moving those around, balancing them out to make sure that we um, don't overload. Great. Um, just, I guess, maybe one more kind of, it'll be a mixture. When talking about the monitoring kits and having our, our educators um, be in charge of that on top of all the other things that they're going to be handling on the in the day i've heard um, talk that they've been told in meetings that they will be in charge of um, helping to clean bathrooms in between breaks and um, possibly not even getting their lunch break until the end of the day um, i would hope that those things are um, not what we're planning to put on them on top of everything else they're already handling um, I guess I just really have a concern that that we don't overload them and and give them more than they already have to deal with. Um, I understand that we don't have the funding and these are things that we need to lobby for, which is a whole different subject. Um, I guess I is that true that teachers have been asked? I mean, I know they've been asked to help clean their classrooms, and that's. Um, you know, we don't have any choice in that matter, but is this something where we have asked on the elementary level anyways, our teachers to possibly use their break time to help, you know, clean a bathroom? Not that, not that I'm aware of, and contractually they, they have a duty-free lunch and then they're prep, so I, yeah, I've not heard that, nor have we had any conversations as leaders. We too don't want to overload our teachers and value how hard they they do work, will continue working, and how do we create a supportive environment so that um, they can be successful for our students. I, I can jump in quick too, Allison. There will never be a, a time when we'll ask teachers to clean restrooms or do cleaning outside of their classrooms. Great. Thank you. That's all I have. Ms. Ellison. I just have a, a final comment that I would like to make. Um, I want to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work our district leadership has invested this summer to make this impossible decision. They have listened, reflected, and shifted. And an example is scheduling this board meeting today when the original plan was to make the decision on August 20th. I have the highest respect for their work and agree that we need to lean upon the scientific data and state guidance available to us to make this decision. These have been an agonizing few weeks and I want our community to know that we have thought deeply about how to create the best situation for our students and teachers. But I respectfully disagree with the decision to start in a hybrid learning model. As a board member, I try very hard to make decisions through the lens of that responsibility and not let my personal situation lead the way. Yet the complexity of human experience makes it impossible to disentangle the two. 
I'm a parent of four students in the White Bear schools, one of whom has an IEP. My husband was laid off in March due to COVID and we're waiting to see what the fall will look like before we figure out his next step. I work full time and simply cannot do my job well while helping my kids learn from home. I'm in a similar situation to many of our community's parents where our livelihoods depend on our kids being back in school. But I also, I also know that the best thing for my kids to be in school but sense that the situation is too precarious. I have read every single word that has been sent to the board, meter, board members from teachers, staff, and community members, including the many that have come in today. The people that work in our schools are the experts in their craft, and I'm hearing many of them say that distance learning in their professional opinion is the right course. Our pre-K teachers feel more comfortable continuing in person, but many of the elementary and secondary teachers do not. And I we believe we should respect both to know their students' spaces and instruction. We trust our experts in other areas, such as epidemiology, to guide us based on their experience and learning, and I would be remiss if I didn't recommend that we strongly consider the words of our teachers and staff. This is not intended to deflect from the hard work of our district leadership who care deeply about our community. I reject any statement that infers that we don't care about the safety of our students and teachers. I understand the state recommendations and the data in school districts are complex creatures. If we understand, however, that we are likely to end up in a distance learning model at some point, I would prefer to start there and ease back into hybrid. I would rather students come back to school because numbers are decreasing and we can find joy in that shift to in-person. Then students have to move to distance learning because numbers are increasing. Every fiber of my being wants our students to be back in school. I know that this is best for them and for the teachers and staff who love them. This decision, quite honestly, is torturing me. But if Governor Walls, as Governor Walls had said, the safety of our students and staff is priority number one, then I respectfully disagree with the decision to start the 2020-21 school year in a hybrid model. Thank you, Ms. Ellison. Are there any other questions, comments? Ms. Thompson. Sorry about that. Um, I would just, I would also like to say that I have been uh, not sleeping well. This has really been something that has been weighing on my mind. Uh, I also have two students in the district. One is going to be a sixth grader. And as we all know, transitioning into sixth grade in a normal school year is one of their most difficult transitions that our, that our children and our students make. And um, this is definitely not um, an help, a helpful way to ease into that transition for my daughter. Um, I also have a senior in high school um, who honestly has uh, personally herself chosen, she is gonna be 18 in September, that she uh, is starting the year in the distance learning and will probably continue that um, throughout the school year. I have gone back and forth in, in where I feel like we should be when we start the school year. I honestly um, don't feel that I personally am, am qualified to make this decision all on my own, which is why I uh, very much appreciate everybody's hard work uh, in this decision making. I would say that some of the communications I have had in our elementary school level um, they started out nervous when they had been told they were going at a 75-25 capacity, but once they heard that it was going to be a 50-50, um, they were overjoyed. I, I don't want to say I'm speaking for all of them, as I definitely am not, um, but they felt more comfortable. Um, as an example, uh, some of the teachers that are currently working in our summer school program where they have students in the classroom, you know, in kindergartners and preschoolers, um, and their amazement and um, appreciation for the students who are there wearing the masks and doing uh, what the students um, have been asked to do. And they are extremely proud of them and, and amazed at how well they have done with obviously the support of our amazing educators who have made uh, the, the process uh, easier for them. I, I am still, 
back and forth on, on what I want to do. I have, um, this is definitely not an easy decision and I have read every single one of your emails. I feel, I think, um, I don't exactly know what I'm going to do, to be honest. I would like our little ones to start in school. I feel that we could probably manage that the safest. I am mostly concerned with our secondary program and how we are really going to make that work. I think we can make it work. I feel like we need more time to make it work the right way. And I do like the suggestion of giving that one more month uh, time so teachers can collaborate more. Um, I, I don't know if four weeks is enough time to do it properly, um, but I do just want to say to the educators that are listening today that there is not one of us who does not take this decision lightly. It has been difficult for all of us. And we appreciate every single one of you. And I, I don't take your safety lightly either. It, it is something that we all have thought about. But, you know, I look at the data and I have done a lot of research at many different sites and locations. And I have really tried my hardest to take my emotion out of it. And it is difficult. Um, but I want you to know that no matter what the decision is that is made here today, that I as a school board member are here to support you and would ask that you always feel comfortable to reach out to us and let us know uh, what you need from us and what we can do to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Are there any other questions or comments at this point in time? Seeing none, I just uh, want to, I guess, add my comments at this point. Um, this has been a very, very, very trying time um, as Ms. Ellison and Ms. Thompson has, has, uh, have already mentioned. Uh, this board, I, regardless of which way each of us individually fall on this issue, um, has been, uh, each member has been tortured to a certain extent, to a great extent, I would have to say, uh, with this decision, uh, the impending decision. Um, there's, I, I can't tell you how many hours I have spent just uh, sitting back, hardly able to concentrate on my daytime job, trying to figure out which way to go on this thing. Um, I went back and forth, back and forth. I think there are tremendous issues on each side of this uh, and tremendous uh, amount of valid points, arguments to be made on each side of this. As a result, I don't think, I've come to the conclusion, I can't say that there's a right answer. I can't say that there is a wrong answer. Uh, I will say, uh, also echo Ms. Uh, Ellison's remarks, uh, that uh, regardless of the vote um, and how it comes out, uh, for example, myself in terms of care for teachers, care for staff, as well as students, um, it couldn't be greater. I have a brother that is a retired teacher, a sister-in-law that's a retired teacher. I have five cousins, one of which is my favorite cousin, is a teacher currently. I have, um, have a niece in the Newport School District that is currently a teacher. Um, I reject any type of comments and any feelings that th this board uh, does not take teacher safety into account or staff safety. Um, that being said, I this situation, there is a lot of fear, and I understand that fear. Um, you know, it's, it's something that none of us encountered, none of us ever wanted to be in. Um, you know, as I've thought about it, I... I I know a lot of people have legitimate concerns that are underlying with regard to that fear. Uh, you know, underlying health conditions, age, so on and so forth. I also feel that 
this fear has paralyzed a lot of people, and that is concerning to me. Um, you know, I hearken back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's comments back in 1933, I believe it was, when the nation was in the throes of the Great Depression, people were unemployed, people were starving in soup kitchens standing in soup kitchen lines to actually get their sustenance. Um, people were had major mental health issues and were harming themselves left and right. He brought the nation together to a great extent by basically saying that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I don't want to oversimplify that. You know, there are certain reasons for people in in cases, some cases to be fearful. But I am concerned that this thing has taken on a life of its own in terms of a paranoia to the degree that is not healthy also. Um, so as a result, I, I just highly recommend that uh, individuals, whether they be teachers, whether they be uh, students, parents, to, um, to seek help if that is becoming an issue. Um, I, I just am very concerned about that, about that. As one who has dealt with mental health issues in the past, uh, depression um, and so forth, and I have no bones about saying that, um, I, I do know that that can be a, uh, a cause of concern for people. And so if fear is overtaking you, uh, please reach out, talk to people, seek help if need be. So um, with that being said, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns on the part of the board? Okay, uh, we have before us um, a recommendation. Uh, the recommendation is that uh, we take uh, action on adoption of a base learning model for the 2021 school year. That would be hybrid uh, learning model for grades K through 12 uh, plus. Uh, so with that, I guess, do I hear a motion uh, for that uh, recommendation? So moved. Uh, Ms. Beloyd uh, has uh, made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Arcand uh, has second. Is there any further discussion before we uh, we take a vote? Any further comments, questions, discussion at all? I can see three of the board members here. Ms. Beloyd, anything from you? Dr. Newmaster, anything from you? No, nothing from me. Dr. Newmaster? <clears throat> I'm just asking about the way it is stated in the motion. Does this imply that this is the only choice for the entire year? The that this is the base, the distance learning is the base model. Because if that's what it implies, that's different than saying this is how we will start. This is how we will start. And we haven't set any time frame like some districts have said, we will reassess at the end of the month or at teacher convention or trying to look for transition times. This is just a generic, we'll start this way. That's correct, Marge. Dr. Newmaster, is, did you have any further follow-up or question? Okay. Anything else before we proceed to take the vote? Okay. Uh, yes, at this point, would the clerk uh, read the roll, please? Beloyed. Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison, nay. Newmaster? I'm going to say aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcand? Aye. Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, uh, I guess uh, 
there is no other vote of the of the uh, anybody that's uh, opposed and and just technically ask that, but I believe uh, uh, we everybody voted. So, um, Mr. Chapman, we, uh, Chapman? Yes. yes. Can I just make, can I just make one comment that I I think is kind of funny, but I wanted to point somebody out from last uh, spring during the distance learning. Um, he did the AP U.S. History class, Joe Held. <laughs> he actually, if anybody is looking in the history section for a model of how to keep your students engaged, he would be a great person to go to because my son actually looked forward to the presentations that, that Mr. Held gave. So I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to him. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Anything else at this point? Otherwise, I believe we have uh, reached the uh, end of the agenda. Seeing none, hearing none, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Vice Chair Chapman, I move for an adjournment. Okay, we have a, a motion to adjourn by Dr. Arcand. Uh, is there a second? I will second that. Um, and let's, uh, I guess for formality or, or official purposes, let's uh, take roll call, please. Beloyed. Here. Oh, aye or nay? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison, aye. Newmaster? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Arcand? Aye. We are adjourned. I appreciate uh, very much everybody's comments. Um, I respect, again, everybody's position on this. And I, uh, I, I just uh, don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong. It's just a, a bad place that we're in. <laughs> and so I thank you to everybody. Thank you to everybody listening. Uh, all of the interest, all of the emails that we've received, the text messages, and so forth. Um, and with that, I guess we will uh, end this meeting. Thank you all.